we have just been looking at the two uh, opposites and uh, this of course is already a part of the idea of right view that there are two opposites and that these are pointless that don't go anywhere and that it is the middle way that actually matters and is important uh, so so all of this is really part of right outlook how we think about the world uh, and that when you think about the world in the right way then your values come in line what is important to you what you value and when you value the right thing then you prioritize the right things uh, you practice in a way that actually leads to something beneficial and instead of being pointless things, things instead start to have real benefit and real value in your life so all of these things matter all of these things are an aspect of that right view uh, so now what is that middle way and uh, surprise surprise here is the middle way it is simply this noble eightfold path uh, that is right view uh, right thought uh, right speech right action right livelihood uh, right effort right mindfulness and right immersion uh, this is that middle way which gives vision and knowledge uh, leads to peace, to direct knowledge, to awakening, and to extinguishment. Uh, so there you are, Noble Eightfold Path is, the, uh, uh, is that uh, right path, the middle way. And of course that Noble Eightfold Path is uh, kind of characterized by where it leads, yeah, the highest point of that Noble Eightfold Path. Remember again the Buddha on his uh, before his awakening he attained the jhanas yeah the jhana was the he realized this is the path to awakening so the jhanas really are the epitome if you like of the noble eightfold path uh, yeah and of course jhanas are states of intense happiness and pleasure uh, dif very, very different from sensual pleasures uh, because they are go inward they are very personal uh, but still, that is what they are about. So it is a path of happiness, yeah, this Noble Eightfold Path. Uh, it culminates in the highest happiness uh, it is possible to experience as a human being. Uh, so it's kind of very interesting, very exciting. Uh, and once you start to understand this, it becomes very interesting to practice the spiritual path. Uh, uh, because all of this other stuff is unreliable and uncertain. Uh, but here you have the, the uh, Buddha promising you the highest kind of happiness. Uh, but um, just very briefly, I'm not going to talk so much about the Noble Eightfold Path now, but just very briefly how it works. And as always, it starts out with right view. Yeah, and uh, remember that the Noble Eightfold Path is a causal path, is a conditioned path. So each factor leads on to the next one. So each factor depends on the previous one, yeah. And because it is such a, it is a condition path where each factor leads on to the next one, uh, it means that the first one is incredibly important, uh, yeah. If the each one depends on the previous one for its existence and strength, uh, then the first factor is going to be incredibly important because it leads to all the other ones, uh, and that's why right view is so uh, matters so enormously. If you have wrong view and it's a serious wrong view, then it's going to lead you completely astray. It's going to make you do uh, all kinds of silly things in life, maybe lead an immoral life, uh, and never really have any spiritual progress whatsoever, simply because of that wrong view at the beginning. Uh, so right view here is absolutely fundamental. Uh, and um, very often in Buddhism, when we talk about right view, we say that it, things like rebirth and kamma are what right view is about, uh, or the awakening experience of the Buddha is what right view is about. Yeah. If you ask people, they will ask you, have you got right view? Yes, I believe in rebirth. Okay, that factor is finished. Uh, sometimes people think that. Yeah, I, I almost used to think like that myself when I started out. Ajahn Brahm asked me when I want to become a monk. Ajahn Brahm said to me, uh, do you believe in rebirth? I said, yeah, maybe, I guess so. Okay, fine, we can become a monk. Yeah. <laughs> Something like that. Yeah, so is, is that enough? But the, the point about Reber, a point of my right view, is that actually it is involves a lot more than just saying yes to rebirth or yes to kama. It involves, first of all, understanding the implications of these things. What does it mean that, what the, that there is a rebirth? What does kama mean? What does it mean to me personally? How does it affect my life? Okay, there is rebirth. Actually, it doesn't affect my life, so just forget about it. But that's the wrong way of thinking. Uh, actually, if you think about rebirth and karma in the right way, it has a tremendous impact on how you live, uh, 
how you think about existence, uh, what things you value in this world. Uh, all of these things depend on this, but it, you need to develop that thought, yeah? develop that idea in such a way that it actually starts to have an impact on your life. That is when it really matters. Uh, but even more than that, all of the ideas of Buddhism all the things I've been talking about now are aspects of right view. So we need to broaden it out from the idea of just kamma and rebirth. Uh, in fact, very often, if you look at the definition of right view uh, as the first factor of the Noble Eightfold Path, uh, it is often called the Four Noble Truths. Uh, yeah, Four Noble Truths is right view. So in other words, the Four Noble Truths, uh, understanding these things, actually this is that right view at the very beginning of the Noble Eightfold Path. Uh, that's why we're talking about it. Uh, yeah? And because it includes all other teachings of Buddhism, it also includes ideas of rebirth and kamma and all that, but it's much broader. Everything the Buddha taught can be ar arguably is an aspect of this right view. Uh, so very, very important and very useful to think about it because if you the practice isn't going forward. Uh, it could be that your right view at the beginning is not strong enough. Or you need to develop it more. Uh, you need to bring it more in line with how the Buddha looked at things. Uh, and the more you do that, uh, the more the easier it is, the more powerful your practice is going to become as a consequence. Uh, so once you have right view, what happens next? Well, then you have right thought. Uh, you start to think in the right way. You think about the world in the right way. You perceive in the right way. Your entire mental world starts to point in the same way as the Buddha's mental world points. Yeah? Points towards Dhamma. You think in a way that aligns with the way the Buddha was thinking. Yeah? Yeah? So you start to kind of shift your attention, shift the way you think. Yeah? Another way of translating this particular word, Samma Sankappa. Sankappa means often like to plan. Yeah? To plan or to uh, to intend something. So often sankaba can be, can be considered right planning, right intention, very often called, yeah? Right aim, right goal, right purpose. Yeah, all of these things are, in a sense, samma, sankapa. Because once you look at the world in a certain way, once you understand how the world really works, once you understand where you find happiness, where you find suffering, uh, you start to look at the world in a different way. Uh, you start to search more for the real happiness and give up the suffering of the world. Uh, yeah, and that becomes then right aim. You're aiming for something else. Uh, your purpose is found somewhere else. Uh, instead of your purpose being all about the pleasures, ordinary pleasures of the world, uh, it starts to become aligned with the idea of spiritual pleasure and spiritual happiness. Uh, so you realign your outlook in this way, uh, and then uh, this is then Samma Sankapa. And then once you realign your outlook of the world in this way, uh, then you start to live morally, yeah? because you understand that morality actually is a source of happiness. Uh, right speech, Samma, samma Varcha, Samma Kamanta, right action, uh, right livelihood, are all about that uh, um, uh, morality, yeah? how we live in the world, how we treat other people, etc. Uh, why? Well, because you know that being moral, being a kind and good person, actually leads to your happiness and also to others. Uh, and uh, it's very obvious when you think about it. I'll maybe talk more about that later on, but let's leave that out for now. Uh, and then, uh, once you kind of purify your moral conduct to some extent, uh, then you have Samma Vayama or Samma Padana, which is the right effort. Yeah, the right effort has to do with how we develop our mind, basically. So ordinary morality and then the deep, profound morality of mental conduct, whereby you are kind even in the way you think about things. This is why Buddhism is so profound and why Buddhist morality can be so hard to practice. You even have to think in the right way. It's high demand, isn't it? Uh, you have to think in the right way. For many people, they think, wow, that's impossible, the mind is out of control. How can I, how can I think in the right way here? But your mind isn't out of control. Uh, yeah? Or the mind is out of control to some extent, uh, because of your habits or whatever, but you can reprogram your mind. So do you want to reprogram your mind? That's the question. You have to want it first of all. Uh, how do you want it? By having right view. Uh, when you have right view, you actually think, yay, reprogramming of the mind. <laughs> Yeah, because right view makes you understand why this is important, why it really matters to be 
super kind all the way to the core, then the right purpose arises, yes, I must do it, and then you actually do it. Uh, you just need to understand the tools of how to reprogram your mind. Uh, so you're like a robot, you need to reprogram your mind. Uh, and I like this idea as of being like a robot. We don't feel like robots, we feel like we are autonomous beings in charge of ourselves, but in many ways we are like robots, and that's why it feels like you're not in control of your mind. It feels like sometimes you just get angry, yeah, it's not your fault, right? It just happens because other people are being stupid, and then of course you have to get angry, there's no choice in the matter. But actually, it isn't quite like that. It is true to some extent that you haven't got choice. It is true to some extent that sometimes anger arises in certain situations and you cannot do too much about it. It's almost automatic, that's what it feels like. But still, you can reprogram. And the reason you can reprogram is because you can look at things in a new way. And as you allow that idea to sink in, this new way of looking at things, your mind is reprogrammed. You don't get angry and upset anymore. Where you used to get angry and upset. Uh, and some of you have been doing this path for a long time, you will know that this actually works. Uh, instead of looking at people as someone who's doing bad things towards you, uh, you look at them as people who are trapped in their own stupid habits uh, and they can't do anything different. Uh, and once you do that, there's something magical happens inside of you. If you really do it profoundly, something magical and beautiful happens. Uh, you start to have compassion for those people who oppress you. Yeah. <laughs> it, it sounds almost impossible, but it isn't. And the reason you do that, because you know they have the problem. Yeah, they have the problem. They are creating so much suffering for themselves. It makes very good, good sense to have compassion for them. It takes a while to get to that point, but that is really where we're heading towards. And it's not that hard to do. This is the, the weird thing. Yeah. Most people in the world think it's impossible, but actually it is not that hard. It's just a matter of applying yourself in the right way. Yeah. So the purity of morality, then the purity of the mind. I, I think this is some of the most important things in Buddhism. If you really want to practice and you really want to purify yourself, uh, these areas are so important. Uh, and that's why I talk about the same area s even on one single retreat many, many times, because I think it really matters, yeah? If you can do that, everything else uh, tends to fall into place. Uh. And then, uh, once your mind is purified to a certain extent, that's when meditation becomes possible. And that is here, called here, what, is, what does he call it? Right mindfulness, yeah? Right meditation, if you like. Samma sati is the Pali word for that. Uh. And uh, mindfulness meditation, Meditation only becomes possible once you have a very high degree of moral purity, even mental purity. And that's why some people can find it very hard to do meditation practice. Yeah? You sit down, the mind is out of control, you feel terrible and you don't, never want to do meditation again. And it's okay. I, as I always say, meditation is not the foundation of the Buddhist path. Uh, the foundation of the Buddhist path is the quality of your heart. Uh, yeah? It's whether you are a kind and caring person, uh, whether you don't get angry too easily, that is really the foundation of the Buddhist path. Uh, so if you want to be a Buddhist, all you really have to do is to have that intention to be kind. You don't even have to be kind. Yeah? Being kind can be difficult, but at least you have to have the intention to be kind. Uh, is there anyone here who does not have the intention to be kind? Everyone has the intention to be kind, yeah? Why? Well, because we know that kindness is good. We know that we feel good about ourselves. Everyone feels good if we're kind to each other. Of course we have to be kind. It's the only sensible thing to be here. So we understand that already. And uh, if, you, if, you don't, you know, if you don't want to be kind, then maybe no point in being here, yeah? So, but, so if you sneak out after this talk and never come back again, I uh, know you were that kind of person. <laughs> you don't have to raise your hand. Too embarrassing to raise your hand. Yeah? So you, just, you can just disappear quietly and that's, that's okay. Yeah? So, uh, but we all know that already and that's of course why you're here. Yeah? It's, so, so, it's so bleeding obvious. Uh. So this is what we have to do first of all. So don't feel bad if you feel you can't meditate. It's very quite common in this world uh, that people ca cannot meditate and it's okay. Just think, okay, let me come back to the, more, to the even more basic things. Uh, we put those into place first of all. Then uh, all of this will actually come as a matter of course down the line, down the track, uh, if I keep on practicing and doing the right thing. Uh. That's why meditation comes at this point. You will notice meditation comes at the seventh factor of the Noble Eightfold Path, not the first factor. 
You might think it's the first factor with some meditation systems, but it's not the first factor, it's the seventh factor. All of those other things really have to be in place, first of all. Uh, some people are born into this world with very pure hearts. Uh, some people are very good people straight away. They can meditate straight away. Some people like Ajahn Brahm, he sits down, meditates for, you know, before he becomes a monk and bang, he gets into this profound meditation state. Why? Well, because probably with a name like Ajahn Brahm, he probably was a Brahma in a past life, yeah? yeah? That's why Brahma Vangso means the lineage of Brahma, the family of Brahma. Bang! Dick comes down, okay, now you are Brahma Vangso. So, <laughs> one of the nice things about living with Ajahn Brahm is you start to realize how pure, so, such a pure-hearted person, a yeah, very, very pure heart, uh, and it's very beautiful to see that. Uh. And then, once you get your meditation into business, into practice, then comes the Samma Samadhi, right immersion, it is called by Ajahn Sudato. And uh, it's an interesting translation, not my preferred translation, but it's an interesting one. Uh. I don't know if it makes any sense to you. Does it make any sense to you, right immersion? Uh, yeah, one person says yes, yeah, what, two persons say yes? No, so one person says no. <laughs> okay, so I, I, let me just explain this very briefly, because it's, it's useful to know. Usually, Samma Samadhi translated as right concentration, yeah? But if you have listened to Ajahn Brahm talking a few times, you know that right concentration, not such a good translation, uh, yeah? Because concentration means using willpower usually in modern society. You concentrate on reading something, you concentrate on your job, and it leads to, leads to tiredness in the mind, it leads to too much will, and you cannot sustain the meditation in that way. So I like Ajahn Brahm's translation, right stillness. Uh, I think that's a very beautiful translation. It's very meaningful. Everybody can understand what that means. Yeah, Peace inside, stillness inside. There's something marvelous, something we all can relate to when you hear that. So what about right immersion? Well, the first thing to know is that when you, hear the, when you see the word right immersion, straight away you know, Ajahn Sudrato, Ajahn Sudrato. Yeah? He is the only one who translates in this way. Nobody else, not even on Mars or even in the neighboring galaxy, do they use immersion. Yeah, <laughs> he is the only one. <laughs> so, uh, and uh, he, yeah, so I think he w I think part of it is you want to give another angle on Samma Samadhi. And this is one of the reasons why it translates in this way. And he maybe also wants to get a little bit closer to the root meaning of Samma or of Samadhi that you find in, that existed even prior to Buddhism. So the idea of immersion, yeah, if you, Im if you immerse something, if, you take, if you're doing the dishes and you have a dirty cup, uh, you immerse that cup into the water, so it's completely inside the water. Yeah? That's the idea of immersion. Uh. And meditation experience, when they are deep, they, are a bit like, they can be a bit like that. Uh. You are immersed, you are no longer in contact with the world around you. You're fully immersed in that meditation experience. Yeah? You've lost contact with your senses, lost contact with the external world. And that is why the idea of immersion is interesting here. Yeah? Immersed in your experience of samadhi. So it gives you a different angle on uh, meditation, yeah? on samma samadhi, and that's why it's interesting. But to me, it's a bit, uh, I feel it's a bit technical, to be honest. Uh, and that's why I'm not so keen on that uh, uh, translation, uh, but uh, nevertheless, uh, it, it, it has it certainly has some interesting sides to it. Uh. Okay, so that is how the path works. Yeah, you notice that it is a conditioned path. Every step coming after the previous one, and it starts with the right view. And because the right view is so important, this is one of the reasons why I wanted to focus on this. Uh. Now, if you practice this path in the right way. What does it lead to? And what it leads to is this thing here. It leads to vision and knowledge. Vision and knowledge in Pali are uh, jnana, dasana usually, but here it's chakku karani, jnana karani, jnana and chakku. It's very similar to jnana dasana. Dasana and chakku, dasana is seeing, chakku is like the eye. Uh, so it leads to Vision and knowledge. What is vision and knowledge in Pali? Well, usually it is the attainment of a stream entry. When you become a stream entry, you enter the stream of the Dhamma, you become someone bound for enlightenment. Yeah? 
This is often you hear, listen to Buddhists that say, yeah, my goal is to become a stream enter in this lifetime. Uh, and that is because then the goal is assured. There's no uh, uh, chance anymore of going backwards on the Buddhist path. That's kind of why people want to aspire for this. Uh, so, but you can see there, the definition of uh, this uh, stream entry is, uh, is vision and knowledge. Yeah? This is what happens when you become a stream entry. Uh, so what does it mean to be a stream entry? What it means is that you see the Dhamma, you see what the Buddha taught fully for the first time. Uh, and that's why you get this chakku karani jnana, literally the making of the eye, the making of knowledge, yeah? knowledge pr production uh, is what it means for the first time you understand exactly what the Buddha is talking about. Uh, you're not yet fully enlightened, uh, but you are now irreversibly heading towards awakening. Uh, and of course, these two words, uh, jnana and chaku, uh, they are very closely related to view, yeah, to ditti. Even in English, they are closely related. Uh. So what is happening here is that the first part of the Noble Eightfold Path is strengthened. Uh, yeah, it's strengthened absolutely, because now you have the absolute right view of what Buddhism is about. Uh. So as we practice the Noble Eightfold Path, one of the interesting things that is going on as we practice this uh, is that we are re reinforcing the early factors of the path. Uh. So as you practice the second factor, the third factor, the fourth factor, the first factor becomes stronger. Uh. So it's not just a conditionality which moves in one direction, everything starts with right view and it's a conditioned sequence moving forward to sama, samadhi and right immersion. It's also a loop, looping condition where the later factors loop back to the previous one. Huh? So the uh, morality reinforces the right view. Huh? The right effort reinforces the right view. Huh? The right meditation reinforces the right view. Huh? until it becomes fully and absolutely reinforced uh, when you become a stream, a stream enter. Then uh, it is like the final reinforcement and bang, now you are assured. The noble path becomes part of you. Yeah? You can no longer avoid be practicing the noble eightfold path. Uh, it's like you become a little Buddha almost, yeah? baby Buddha, practicing the path, heading towards the big Buddha, uh, the real Buddha. Uh, that's what happens. Uh. So. This is how this works. And so every time you practice well, every time you are more peaceful, yeah, if you have some nice meditations during this retreat uh, where you feel a bit more peaceful, actually your view is better at that point. Remember that, that is very interesting. Yeah? Whenever you are peaceful, you have more right view because you have practiced more of the Noble Eightfold Path. You have more peace. Uh, and for that reason, Sometimes people ask questions like, how should we make decisions in life? It's a very common qu question. How do we decide what is the best thing to do, what is the bad thing to do? And one of the answers to that question is you should only make a decision when you have feel at ease, you feel uh, uh, peaceful, yeah? you feel that there is no defilements in your mind. In other words, when you have practiced the Noble Eightfold Path, uh, it, that practice is as deep as possible yeah, because when it is as deep as possible, the right view is going to be as strong as possible. When you have right view, you're going to make the best decisions in life. Huh? So if you come out of meditation and you feel really peaceful, huh? yeah, but not dull, but kind of bright and peaceful, huh? that is a very good time to make decisions because at that time your right view is going to be stronger than what it normally is. Huh? So ask yourself, what do you want to do when you feel really peaceful? Are you sure you want to go for that promotion? Are you sure you want to kind of strive for that uh, uh, new BMW? I don't know if anyone here is interested in BMWs, but let's say you are, yeah? Maybe you think that's silly anyway, but you know, at that point, maybe you think, actually BMW doesn't matter so much, yeah? I can be nice and peaceful, maybe I can let go of that BMW. Uh, it's a very hard one to let go of, but you know, you know what it's like, sometimes that uh, Deep inside, that view it really penetrates properly, and then you really see actually BMWs, a lot of dukkha BMWs, uh, yeah? a lot of problems with them, people want to steal them and all kind of stuff. Uh, yeah? So you have to look after them, then you have to guard them, and all of this stuff takes so much time. Much better to have an old beat up car. Is, is, that, is, it, is that people have that in, in Malaysia? Old beat up cars? Yeah, good, yeah, because nobody wants to steal them. Uh, they want to leave them alone. Yeah? So the more dodgy your car is, the better. Uh, and that's kind of one of the things. You can really relax about your car. If someone steals it, you say, thank you, thief, for stealing my car. It was so bad anyway, yeah? So let's get rid of it. Uh, that's kind of the right attitude. Uh, if you have that attitude, 
very little dukkha in life. Um. So this is the idea here, the idea that right view builds up as you build up the kind of foundational steps on the path, yeah, you build it up more and more uh, and you can feel that clarity in your mind, you can feel that actually uh, you understand better about uh, of the world and, uh, and the way things are. When you have a lot of desire in your heart, when you have a lot of anger, don't make any decisions at all because they're going to be stupid decisions. Uh, desire and anger and ill will skew your uh, reality. They are, distort the mind uh, and all you're going to do is make silly, stupid decisions as a consequence. Uh. So that's knowledge and vision. And we have the other words here. It, it leads to peace, uh, yeah, upas, upasama. We have a monk in our monastery at Bodhinyana called Upasamo. That's his name. Uh, and uh, you can go and have a look at him and see if he looks peaceful or not. Uh, I'll leave that to you to decide. <laughs> uh, and when the Buddha uses the word peace, he doesn't mean just a little bit of peace, he means a lot of peace. Uh, yeah, so Upasamo here is like, the Buddha doesn't usually mince his words. Uh, so when he says peace, it's peace. It's, it's like the arahantship, really. So all of these words at the end here really refer to arahantship. They can, of course, refer to partial understandings, partial peace, but that's really what they're pointing to. Direct knowledge, again, very similar kind of thing. Abhinya in Pali, uh, often referring to the six direct knowledges. Uh, awakening, Samboda or Sambodhi. Uh, yeah, they are uh, sometimes translated as enlightenment, but here awakening, which I think is a preferable translation. Uh, and then the last one, which is extinguishment. Uh, you know which word that is? In Pali? You know this word in Pali? What is he wrote? May, maybe, but not, not in this case. <laughs> okay. It's Nibbana. Yeah? Nibbana is the word here, because uh, in Pali, the uh, uh, Nibbana is always the going out of the lamp, yeah? the long out uh, of the Nibbuto, as uh, of Nibbana. So uh, uh, we tr you translate the, pa the Pali word Nibbana because it actually has a meaning here, yeah? instead of actually leaving it as Nibbana, which is very common. Uh, because that gives you a flavor of what it actually is and what it refers to, rather than being able to read whatever you like into this particular word. Uh. So Nibbana is the, is the word there. Yeah. I'm just testing you occasionally. Is that okay? Can I test you occasionally? <laughs> you don't mind? Yeah, yeah. Giving a little test. Uh, so I'll see what happens. Uh, if you can't answer, I'm not going to put a bla black cross against your name or anything. I promise not to do that. Uh, so you're not gonna, nothing is going to happen. Uh, and if you answer correctly, uh, you're not going to become the teacher's pet either. So it's, it's okay. Uh, yeah, so we're going to, it's gonna, no, no problems. Uh. Yeah. Liberation and Nibbana, they are basically just different ways of uh, looking at the same, th same idea. Huh? Yeah? So liberation usually means that you are liberated from something. So it focuses on the things that are disappeared. Uh, so like Dukkha, yeah, you're liberated from Dukkha, it's kind of the most important one. Huh? And whereas extinguishment maybe focus more on the things that are extinguished. What, what is extinguished? Well, uh, defilements are extinguished, for example. Yeah? Greed, hatred and delusion would be what is extinguished. Uh, these are called the flames that burn you, the fires that burn you. So it's a slight, just a different angle on the same thing, really. Yeah? And uh, both liberation and Nibbana come in many degrees. Yeah? Liberation is often Vimutti in Pali, uh, or Vimoka, Vimoka, Vimutti, depending on how you translate these words. Uh, and Vimutti can be the first feelings of Vimutti come already quite early on. Yeah? Even if you just become a bit peaceful in a meditation, you feel liberated from all the oppression, all the things that don't make you peaceful. It seems oppressive. So you're liberated from a little bit. Uh, and then the real Vimuttis happen when you get into the jhana states, uh, because you are liberated from so much of samsara, all the sensual realm is gone, and you feel liberated as a consequence of that. Uh. And Nibbana is similar. You have extinguished certain aspects of existence. Uh, so you have extinguished a desire for sensual pleasure and ill will when you get into jhana state. So it's like a small Nibbana before the big one, in a sense. Uh, and it's actually used like that in the suttas. It's called uh, par pari Pariyaya, Pariyaya, something like that, Nibbana. Nibbana, which has a further course to go. It is not the final Nibbana. Nipariyaya Nibbana is the one which doesn't have that. Uh, so Nibbana too is kind of distinguished according to degrees. Uh, yeah, sometimes. Usually it just means arahantship, but uh, sometimes it can be distinguished in this way. Yeah. 
Okay, so that is the middle way. So that's what you have to do if you want to practice the middle way here. So what do you think? Any thoughts about this, the middle way? Does it sound like a good way? Yeah. Sound, sound, does, does, does it sound doable? Yeah. Can you do it? Where are you on this middle way? Have you, are you halfway or are you three quarters or are you the first factor? Or <laughs> so that's it anyway, that's what you have to do. Yeah, it's a good thing to come back to all the time, the Noble Eightfold Path, uh, and just to remind you of what this practice is all about. Uh, and then uh, to ask yourself, where are you on this particular path? Uh, which factor should you be focusing on her? So, um, yeah. Anyway, so if you and if you have any questions, you at any time, please ask. Yeah, don't feel shy. And if you think that you have only such simple, see, my question is so stupid. Yeah, everyone else knows already except for me. I don't want to ask that question. Too embarrassing. Please don't be embarrassed. Yeah, anything is okay because very often other people will have the same question if you have it. Uh, so don't feel shy about that. Uh, in a, a, in a, a gathering like this, there's going to be some people who are very knowledgeable, uh, yeah, who know a lot. Uh, some people who don't know so much, uh, and uh, that's okay. We can all uh, we have time for everyone. Otherwise, it becomes uh, it do doesn't really work out. Uh. Okay, so now I want to start on the noble truth of suffering here, uh, and the. Uh, uh, Arya Satcha, Dukkha Arya Satcha, yeah, which is what it's called in the uh, uh, suttas, uh, and th this is the first of the four noble truths. Uh, and this is to understand the reality of dukkha. Dukkha means suffering in, in Pali. Sukkha is the opposite, means happiness. Yeah? So suffering and happiness, uh, these are the two kind of opposites on the Buddhist path. Uh, and uh, it's very useful to understand what actually is suffering in the world and what is not. Uh, because obviously, once you understand that, uh, you can guide yourself in a new way. You can face in a different direction and start to move towards those things that are real happiness uh, and avoid those things that are suffering. Uh, this is uh, so important uh, and uh, it would be something that uh, the earlier in life you know about this uh, and you get a feeling for this, uh, the better it is. Uh, and then you can start to live a life which is more useful and more powerful. Uh, so, um, this, so let me just read it out and then I will comment on these things uh, uh, afterwards. Uh. Now this is the noble truth of suffering. Uh. Rebirth is suffering. Uh. Old age is suffering. Illness is suffering. Uh. Death is suffering. Uh. Association with the disliked is suffering. Uh. Separation from the liked is suffering. Uh, not getting what you wish for is suffering. Uh. So what do you think about that? Make sense? You can, so, so how, it's interesting isn't it? Because f this kind of, everyone understands this. Yeah? It's very hard not to understand this. Maybe rebirth is a bit difficult, but the rest of it, uh, everyone can understand this. Uh. So why does the Buddha need to say it if everyone understands it? Uh? Is the Buddha wasting his time? We know it already. Okay, Buddha, we don't need you. We know this already. Go away. Okay, now we can just get on with whatever, we get on with our life. Because we do know this in one way, yeah? That's why everyone recognizes it straight away. That is why we can recognize the teachings of the Buddha, because it says something that we can relate to. The problem is we know it, but we know it only superficially. This is the problem. Yeah, there is an understanding, but it hasn't really penetrated deep enough yet. Uh, and that is where the problem arises. Uh. So these are the sort of things, things that are bleeding obvious. Uh. Everyone knows this is true, uh, and that is the problem. It is a little bit too bleeding obvious. Actually, it is not that bleeding obvious at all. Uh. So these simple facts of life, uh, things that are actually seem to be so obvious, uh, these, are the, these are often the place, the ground of insight, the ground of understanding. Uh, and if you contemplate these things in the right way, something starts to awaken inside of you. Uh, something starts to change. Uh, you start to look at the world in a different way. Uh. I was making the point when I was here last year that one of the interesting things about the biography of the Buddha, which often is not really pointed out, is that the thing that made the Buddha go forth and to become a monk uh, was the reflection on death. Yeah? So it means that the, the, um, 
uh, if you do the reflection on death properly, uh, it has amazing consequences. Uh, yeah, it actually makes the Buddha arise in the world. Uh, just that reflection on death. That's how powerful it is. Uh. And if you, every one of us here, also reflects on death in the right way, it has a similar kind of potential. Uh. The potential is enormous. Uh. Yeah, it moves you in a different direction. It changes the way you think about the world uh, and start to think about life in a different way. That is the potential of thinking about death. Uh. But for most of it, it doesn't happen. Yeah, we think about death and think, yeah, yeah, it's far away, you know, it's not going to happen yet. Uh, or, or whatever. Yeah, you don't re it's not something that really hits you in a very strong way until maybe something happens in your life. Uh, someone dies in your family. Uh, or maybe you get very sick. Maybe you get coronavirus. Uh, Anyone has, have you got coronavirus? You have a mouth? No, you, you're okay. No, you haven't got that. Okay, you, you want to avoid coronavirus, sir. Yeah. <laughs> He's trying to avoid it. Okay. So, uh, yeah, so th then it sometimes penetrates a little bit more. But for the Buddha, it was not enough to think about these things. And ideally, all we have to do is to think about it. We don't have to wait until we're almost dead. Because sometimes it might be too late if you wait for that. Uh. So there's a lot of potential here for understanding this. The whole of Buddhism, as I said last time I was here, was based on the fact that one man thought about death in a very profound way. That is why we have Buddhism today. Yeah? So that shows you the potential of thinking about death. So these things that we're looking at here are actually surprisingly profound. They are surprisingly obvious on one level. That's why almost everyone can understand this. Not everyone, by the way. Some people don't even get this. They kind of think, oh yeah, whatever. And then, but but still, most people get this, uh, and our job is to allow these simple teachings to sink in in a much deeper way to the start to really propel us in our uh, Buddhist practice. This is why all of this is right view. Reflect on these things, these simple things again and again, uh, and they actually start to have a power in your life, and they direct you in a positive way. Uh. So that is the first noble truth. Let's have a look at all of these, these things in a little bit more detail. Uh. So, first thing here is rebirth is suffering, jati, pidukkha. Jati is usually translated as birth, actually usually it means birth or something like that in the suttas. And uh, the first thing that is interesting here is simply that it is translated as rebirth. Because you've probably never seen that translation before, because this is also, I think, again, it's... Uh, Bhante Sujato, who's the only one who translates jati in this way. So, is this correct? Or is it not correct? Should it be birth or should it be rebirth? Does it make any difference? And uh, the point is yeah, that uh, in, uh, from a Buddhist point of view, every time there is birth, every instance of birth is also an instance of rebirth. The two are inseparable. So in the Buddhist outlook, the outlook of ancient India, if you say the word birth, you're also implying rebirth at the same time. But in the modern outlook that we have now, yeah, for a large part of the world, it's maybe a bit different here in Malaysia for people who are Buddhist specifically because you have grown up in a different way. But if you're grown up like me, you know, in the snow and ice of Norway, you have a problem, yeah, because it's no nice no way they have everyone pretty much everyone has kind of strange views about reality. They think there is a creator God uh, and all this kind of stuff, uh, yeah. People and they kind of believe in Christianity and they believe in all and they believe in skiing and all this. Uh, but um, <laughs> but the, it's very hard to kind of get an idea of rebirth in that world. So sometimes because jati, the underlying thing, the underlying understanding is that this is rebirth, uh, sometimes it's better to actually write that in, yeah, to make that clear to an audience that isn't used to the idea of thinking in the way that they thought at that time. Uh, this is why I think Adan Sujato does this, why he calls it rebirth rather than birth, uh, because it is implied in the outlook they had at that time. Uh. And that actually starts to make it more interesting. And uh, one of the things that I remember when I was thinking about this a uh, uh, long time ago, uh, I was thinking about, well, birth here, yeah, not only is the fact that in Indian culture does it mean a rebirth, uh, but actually, in the context of the Four Noble Truths, it must mean, it must mean rebirth. 
logically, uh, yeah, from a logical point of view. Uh, and why is that? Well, and the reason is because the second noble, the third noble truth is about overcoming dukkha. All of this is about overcoming suffering. Uh, yeah, the birth that we have already had, you can't overcome that birth. Uh, the only birth you can overcome, the only suffering you can overcome in terms of birth, is future birth. Uh, so, because our job is to overcome suffering, which includes birth, it must mean rebirth in this context. It cannot mean the birth we already had, because you can't overcome that. Already done, yeah? That was, that was our first mistake, was to get born, uh, yeah? So, because we made that mistake already, all we can do is really to repeat that mistake in the future, and that's what we want to avoid, uh, repeating that same mistake again. Uh. So, actually, logically speaking, it must refer to rebirth. Uh. And, uh, in fact, all the Four Noble Truths refer to rebirth. Uh, the First Noble Truth refers to rebirth in the way I talked about it now. Uh, the Second Noble Truth specifically talks about re rebirth. We'll see that later on. Porno bhavika, it means again existence, yeah, rebirth. Uh, third Noble Truth talks about that very uh, craving which leads to uh, again existence is to be overcome. So that too must refer to rebirth. Uh, and the Fourth Noble Truth is the path which is right view, right here, is also about rebirth. Everything is about rebirth. Uh, all Four Noble Truths concern rebirth. Uh, so rebirth is pretty fundamental to the Buddhist path. Uh. So it is about rebirth. Uh. So why is birth suffering? Why is rebirth suffering? Uh? This is then the interesting point here. Uh. And uh, there is many different ways of thinking about this, but uh, uh, one way of thinking about it is that you could say that just the kind of being born itself is probably not a very pleasant experience, uh, yeah? Neither for the mother nor for the child, but maybe for the child probably, may, I don't know who it's worst for, but you know, obviously difficult, uh, yeah? And you kind of come from a very cozy, nice, warm place and you come into the cold world and somebody gives you a slap on the bottom when you come out, all this kind of stuff, uh, yeah? And maybe not so pleasant to get born into this world. Uh. So this is the first one, but that is a fairly small thing. Yeah, it must mean more than that if it really is to be talked about as suffering here. Uh. And uh, one of the things about because it refers to rebirth, uh, one of the things about it, it is the beginning of another life. Uh. It's the beginning of coming into the world again. It's a start of the cycle again. Yeah, and. Uh, so, and this is very similar. This, this is a, there is a story that Ajahn Brahm told many, many years ago, which uh, which kind of always fits in at this particular point. Uh, and this is the story of uh, many of you will have heard it before. But this is a story about some newspaper article apparently coming out of the U.S. Uh, and according to this newspaper article, they had this kind of column of children being born, all this kind of thing. And according to this article, there was one child was born, uh, and soon after it was born, it opened its mouth and it said. Uh, Oh no, not again. <laughs> yeah. And I think this is the problem. Yeah. Oh no, not again. This is exactly the problem. Uh, because you realize that you have just finished one life. Uh, now you're coming back again. Uh, yeah. And you can kind of see the problem. You can understand now coming back again means having to do all the things again. Uh, all the things that I was hoping to get somewhere but actually haven't got anywhere. Back to square one. Isn't there a snakes game called Snakes and Ladders? You go to the top and then bang, you fall down to the bottom again. And you keep on going round. The problem is that this is a snakes and ladder without exit. There's no exit. Or well, there is an exit, but it's very, very hard to find. Almost every time you come back to square one. Round, down, down. No, don't want to fall down. Down, down, down. A thousand times. A million times. Again and again and again. This is the problem. And so you can see here why this is problematic. And I think the point is that at the moment of rebirth, uh, yeah, if you think about the process of rebirth, the process of the intermediate state and the near-death experience and all of that, uh, you may have read about some of those things. Very interesting, all of this research that has been done. Uh, the mind kind of gets released from the body, and very often, yeah, it's a very happy experience. Uh, this is another reason why it is... Uh, suffering yet to get reborn. Imagine that you come out of your bo body 
Wow, so nice. That body was such a terrible thing, especially when you get really old. The body doesn't work anymore. It's all falling apart. Or you're very sick with some kind of terrible cancer or something. Actually, dying is really nice. Yeah, Dying is one of the great things in life. Wow, dying. Hooray. Finally out of this body. Uh, and, uh, but then, suddenly, you see you have to be reborn. You have to go back into a body again. You've finally been released. Now you have to go back. No. Please, someone help me. God, where are you? I need you. <laughs> there is no God to help you. Yeah, he's not there. When you finally need him, he doesn't do anything. He just, uh, I don't know, sits back and watches or whatever. I don't know what he, what he does, but that God just isn't there. And this is the problem. Yeah, this is kind of if you believe in a God who isn't there, then it's not, you know, suffering. Wrong view causes suffering. Yeah. So you can imagine, it's actually very traumatic. Yeah? And the body that you go into, imagine that tiny little fetus. Yeah? You have no control, just go into this tiny little body and you become kind of a subject to whatever. You, if you have a bad mother who kind of does all kind of stupid things like drinking or whatever, you get drunk already when you're tiny, tiny. <laughs> because you're sharing the blood with your mom, so you can already, you kind of, oh, mom, please don't drink. You say, whoa, I don't know what's happening here. <laughs> But it's traumatic, yeah. This experience of being reborn, having to go back again, subject to the same conditions, uh, being this little baby who has no control, you're 100% really reliant on the world around you. And when you cry, the p your parents are trying to understand why you're crying. But no, not that, I'm not cold, I'm, this is w I'm hungry. Yeah. <laughs> but you can't, or whatever it is, uh, I don't know how it works. I, but anyway, I've never had any ch children, which, uh, but, uh, so so this is why it is difficult. Uh. But what is even worse, I think, and this is kind of the point, is that when you are on that cusp of being reborn, uh, yeah, one thing is the fact that you go back into a body again. You don't want to do that. You have just been released from all the suffering. Now you have to go back into that suffering again. But what is far worse is that at that particular point, you have a kind of overview. Uh. You can see that you have just died in one life. Yeah? Now you understand the process of how you get reborn again into the next life. Uh, suddenly understand that this is the reality of the universe. Uh, how you go from one life to the next one. Uh. So at that point, uh, if you have clarity at that point, if you have mindfulness, uh, if you're able to follow what is going on, uh, you get an insight into samsara, uh, into this existence that goes on and on and on, uh, because you see the process happening before your very life. Uh, yeah? And this is why I think also why the experience of rebirth is so traumatic, uh, because you understand the problem. Uh, yeah? Very, you get its glimpse, yeah, just as you're about to get reborn. This glimpse into the big picture of this process carrying on. You know that it, if this is true in this life, it must also be true in future lives. It must carry on like this potentially forever. And that, I think, is part of the difficulty of being reborn. Why it is so hard and why it is kind of uh, such a, can be a very difficult experience. So uh, this is uh, the idea of birth is suffering. Yeah, it is this feeling that uh, uh, that uh, you kind of have to carry on with this existence, uh, this broader thing, uh, and this I think is a, a big part of uh, uh, of the problem that is happening here. Okay, so uh, there's a lot of activity going on over there. <laughs> so. Uh, <coughs> okay, let's go on to the, um, uh, the next one. Uh, rebirth is suffering. Uh, next one is old age is suffering. Uh, yeah, and again, it's one of those things that you kind of know. Yeah, you kind of, it kind of makes sense that old age is suffering. Uh, and uh, you realize that fairly early on as you get older, yeah, you get past 50 or whatever, your body starting to fall apart and all of these kind of things, and then you can just extrapolate. But of course it's difficult to really understand fully, because 50 is still not so bad. When you get to 80 yeah, or 90, that's when you really get really, really frail. And uh, it's quite hard to sort of uh, imagine even what it is like. But it's useful to try to imagine that, uh, because it is a difficult experience to uh, become older. 
And one of those little things that the Buddha says is to uh, watch your reactions when you see someone getting very old. Yeah, when you see someone who is very frail, who has to be looked after in all possible ways, uh, they have to maybe to be dressed, they have to be cleaned, you have to do everything th for them because they don't really function anymore. Yeah, the legs don't work, the eyesight don't work, the hearing is falling apart, uh, they, everything falls apart and when you start to get really, really old. Uh, and the last six months of m most people's life are often very difficult times and it's also quite undignified yeah to have other people kind of looking after everything and doing everything for you it's not easy you lose your sense of freedom and li liberty you depend a hundred percent on other people it's not very pleasant uh. so how do you feel when you see someone else in that position uh? do you feel okay about it uh? are you able to see yourself in that position uh? are you able to think, yeah that's me right there i too will be like that uh. Because the alternative is even worse. The alternative is to die young. Nobody wants to die young, that's even, even worse. But, uh, so how do you feel? And uh, so that kind of gives you a sense of whether you are ready to accept yourself in that way. Do you feel it's a little bit disgusting and unpleasant and oh, can't take it yeah, when someone is really, really old? Or are you able to see, yeah, that's me. I too will be like that. You can kind of see your own face in that particular way. That is really what we should be able to do, yeah, to remember we too are going to be in this particular situation one day. Yeah. If you're young, you have to be old. Uh, this is part and parcel of life. Uh, you can't avoid this. Uh, this is the way it is going to be. Uh. So test yourself out and see if that works. And then look at that person uh, and remind yourself of the suffering. Uh. Ask them, yeah, what does it feel like? Uh, how do you, you know, don't, don't torture them by kind of bad questions, but, <laughs> but uh, you know, ask them, well, you know, you, you're old now. What, what is your, the wisdom you have gained by being so old? Uh, and how does it, how do you, you know, when you think back upon your youth and you compare it to what it's like to be now, uh, how does it, what does it feel like? Uh, how do you, you know, what do you think about that? It can be quite interesting to talk to old people uh, and gain some insight into that uh, experience of old age. Uh, and they will probably tell you, some of them will tell you that it's okay, but m many of them will tell you actually it is quite difficult to deal with this particular situation. Uh, it's a fascinating thing to do. Often we can learn a lot from other people if we're willing to listen, uh, yeah, and we're willing to kind of ask questions at the right time. Uh, surprising how much we can learn from about the reality of life. Uh. So it is uh, uh, an important, uh, very important, uh, sort of simple little thing that we can do. Uh, but uh, old age is one of those uh, difficult things to bear, uh, but actually something that uh, uh, you can start to get a handle of on right here in this life. Uh. So if you have been born, uh, if you have been young, uh, you must have old age. Suffering comes with a good part, yeah? And when you're young and strong, then often you're a bit foolish. Uh, and when you, by the time you get weak and old, uh, then you start to g gain in wisdom. Uh, there was a, some kind of wit who said long time ago, said that, uh, uh, youth is wasted on the young. Uh. <laughs> and uh, it, I don't think he meant that quite literal. I think what, he, what this person meant was simply that yeah, when you're old, when you finally have your little, little bit of wisdom together, then you lost all your strength. You can't really use that wisdom anymore. And when you're young, often you are, don't really have enough wisdom to maybe know how to youth, use that youth properly. It's not really true. Yeah, sometimes you get old people who are really foolish. Uh, sometimes you get young people who are surprisingly wise. Yeah, it just depends. Uh, so it's not really true. But sometimes there is some truth to that. Uh, so uh, that's kind of what, he, what this person was saying. Yeah. So uh, I'm, I will stop there because if I get, get on to uh, the next part here, it will take us too far, uh, too far away. Uh, so we'll take one thing at a time. Uh, we have a couple of more minutes. Uh, left of this uh, session. Does anyone have any comments or questions about what we have been talking about so far? Uh, does anyone have any experiences of old age already? Uh, are, you, are you okay? Not, not so bad? Uh, <laughs> so, uh, bearable? Uh, at the moment bearable, okay. Okay, good. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, so let's uh, call it uh, enough for now, uh, and then we meet back. What time do we meet back again, Bobby? One thirty. Okay, so we have have a nice lunch together, and then we'll see you back in at one thirty this afternoon. Uh.